Okay, so time for some live coding. Uh, we've already looked through these different bullet points. They're, they're in this uh, overview file in the Git repo in case you want to look it over later. later. And now we'll do a little bit of live coding, uh, as I say, uh, towards a domain-specific language for proof terms. So let's... Um, we can... Whoops. <laughs> well, that was ridiculously big. <laughs> anyway, um, so reminder of some learning outcomes. Uh, so one of the parts of the course is to organize areas of mathematics in domain specific language terms and uh, develop adequate notation for mathematical concepts to perform calculational proofs. So we did some proving on the sort of Jamboard now recently, but we also want to do some proving in Haskell. So um, this is an example of modeling logic with types. And I started with that already in the previous lecture, and uh, I will use uh, the type checker as a proof checker. But it's I, I should, I should uh, stress, as I did last time, that this is sort of a poor man's proof checker. So it's not really a true proof checker. You, you should use, if you really want to prove important stuff, you should use a real proof checker. But a very good illustration of uh, what the, uh, the correspondence between logic and um, types is. So I will now introduce data types which are supposed to used as, be used as building blocks for the logic. So this is different from a data type of syntax trees. So these data types would rather be data types of terms, proof terms. So I will have the system that B is of type T means B is a proof of the theorem. T. So logic theorem C. So first of all, if I should have typing as a way of proving, that means that false should not have any values. So I need a data type false, which has no constructors. So an empty set of proof terms. And there is an extension. I mean, if I enable this extension GADT is I can write empty data types. So false without the E to not clash with the false of Booleans is a data type which doesn't have any values. Still, if I, if I want to know what, what, if I check what false is, uh, okay, I haven't loaded it yet. Uh, what? Okay, it wasn't quite loaded yet. Um, so that's a, that's a data type, but it doesn't have any constructors. I can never make a value out of it. So I could, I could create the function id, for example. I can have, it can have the type false arrow false, which just means that if I would have a value of type false, I could create another one. Oh, sorry, now I see there was questions just uh, minutes ago. Do we know if r to the power of r is rational? Well, uh, it is irrational, but it doesn't matter for the proof that uh, of the existence of, of two numbers there. Uh, and there's also a question, is this true for all irrational numbers? I don't know what is true for all irrational numbers, but what I was proving in the previous one, um, <laughs> yeah, what is false, false? The thing is that when I write, when I write an expression, which is a function type, it will not uh, show it, it would just print it again. So it prints the same thing as I printed. This is the first part. And then it would tell it what type it has. And that was the type of it has. So not very useful. Anyway, I'll go on to define the data type for true, for proving true. So um, here, let's see what, oh, is, what, what is the data type true. Well, it has one constructor and it's called obvious. So Obvious is a proof of truth. Well, true is obviously true. So that's the first test value. 
And then we come to, to proving AND. And I mentioned last lecture that an AND, to prove an AND, we need to prove both the components. So let's see if we can prove uh, AND true true. Anyone have a suggestion for the, what the value, the proof term here could be? Actually, I could say the, the type here is equal to true comma true. Uh, so to, to a pair of true and true. So this has to be a pair of something comma something. And actually the only choice uh, for this whole is the value obvious. So the proof of and true true is obvious obvious. Now this doesn't get very uh, advanced because if you if you would like, but for example, if, if you would try to say that and true false has this proof, then it would say, well, no, it doesn't match. Uh, it can't match the type false with true. So this version with this type works and the type checker will complain if you try to prove it's something which is not true. So we can't prove in general that and of two things are is true, but if we know this, if we know that and of P and Q is true, then it should be possible to prove that and of Q and P holds. So I call this function here swap and its definition is, is gonna be pretty clear. So the only thing that a function of this type can do, remember this type is the same as P comma Q, and this is the same as Q comma P. So the only thing a definition can do is match on two proofs, uh, proof of P. And yeah, that that's becomes a little long. So let's just write A as the proof of P and B is the proof of Q. And then we have to provide something and something of the right types here. And if we line these up, that A is a type, is a proof of P and B is a proof of Q, then we can see even a suggestion over here, a valid whole fit. It's just that B would actually fit here. So let's, okay, let's, let's do B. And in the other place, relevant bindings include A, valid whole fits includes A. So let's, let's put A there. Okay, so this loads. So this is actually swap here is a function. I mean, let's, let's go back to the original type. It's a function which proves that if we can prove and P and Q, then we can also prove and Q and P. And as I mentioned already on Tuesday, implication here, the arrow, the function arrow is an implementation of implication. So this means implies and p, q, and q, p. Because I can implement implies as a function. What is and integer bool? Yeah, good question. So uh, type high equals and integer bool. Um, any suggestions what it could mean? Well, the thing is that for any type, including true, but any type where we have values, then we can prove it. So, so if we want to claim that uh, little high here is of type high, so this is a theorem. Uh, so uh, high is a theorem. Let's see if we can prove it. Anybody have a suggestion of a proof of high? It's, it's easier than you might guess. Yeah, so it, it's a pair of, uh, for example, one and true. So the only thing the type checker here is checks is that we have some value. So and of integer and bool is basically, basically same as and true, true. 
So we sort of we're using the types in a rather lax fashion here. We, we're not really caring about sort of the, I can say here the only property we use about the base types is whether or not they are inhabited. If there are zero values in the type, it encodes false. Otherwise, true. So kind of membership of a set, yeah, something like that. I mean, we're only using the, the emptiness to mean false and non-emptiness to mean true. But yeah, the good question. So it, it's not very useful to say I am the integer bool because it's already, we have already a type uh, which is which has at least one value. But uh, the, the interesting thing that only using uh, false and true and these combinators, we can still build lots of logic. So for example, or, is the can be defined using the either type. So the either type, if you remember, is a type with two constructors set down here, left and right. So that's the uh, or introduction left and or introduction right, or intro left, or intro right. Uh, I don't see how one t proves a theorem high. Well, the theorem uh, saying integer integer is inhabited and bool is inhabited and we prove that by showing that well one is inhibit habitant and we check the tribe yes it's the proof checker would see that int has type integer one has type integer and true has type bool so proof done so the theorem is a rather boring one but the theorem high is basically the same as the theorem and true true, which is rather easy to prove. It's just that here we have lots of choices. I mean, uh, we, we can we can prove this in lots of different ways. We can say two false or 15 true or whatever. Uh, all of those are different proofs of the same theorem. But yeah, it's good questions. Anyway, I want to implement the, the, the swap function here as well. So uh, the swap two function. So we want to show that or is commutative. So the, I want to show, I want to say here also that if you haven't watched the extra lectures on Haskell number three, which uses the either type, there are basically all done this, uh, but it's, it's um, if you want to see some more, more then you can look that up on, on YouTube, the playlist. Anyway, so if I want to write a function here, remember again that we got type synonyms. So this is actually the same as either PQ to either QP and an either type has two possible form, left X or right Y. And now it complains about my right hand side, whoops. Let's put some underscores in here. Okay, it complains, there are some holes. Um, it says, it's hidden perhaps in all other noise, but it says here, X colon colon P is a relevant binding. Um, it's not a, a solution to the problem because I need to prove either QP. So I need to use X in some way. So how do I use X to produce something of type either QP? Any suggestion? Yeah, right, right of x. So remember, uh, x has type p. I can perhaps indent this in a way to make that more visible. And if I indent this as well a bit, then we can see that x is under the p here. It's under the p, it has type p. And then I have to get it under the P here, I have to use right instead of left. And similarly here, I need to use left Y. So you can see from the graphical layout, if nothing else, that I do actually sort of swap them. Um, now, of course, this is not a very interesting proof so far. 
these these proofs are rather trivial proofs, but it is a bit it takes a bit getting used to. And I think I can go on here and implement more and more complicated cases. And there are a few more of them in the book. One of the more interesting being uh, the proof of let's see, it's not not or p not p. So actually, we we can define it here at least. The type not p can be defined as p implies false. So if p implies false, then it's definitely not uh, true and the opposite. So let's say exercise is a proof of not not or p not p. So what does this mean? So not not you've learned from the classical notation that not not is basically the same as, as not doing anything. So this is basically the uh, law of excluded middle. So either p is true or not p is true. That uh, an interesting aspect of this logic in uh, in the type system is that you can't actually prove the law of excluded middle. So you have to settle for this rather indirect definition, which is using two negations outside of it, because this is provable. And as I actually have two more minutes, I might be, I can at least start expanding this one. So now this is, this is type-driven development. It, I don't think you can use intuition to prove this. Uh, but if we look at expanding this type, so if we expand the first not out here, see, not p is equal to p implies false. So this means that, well, uh, this is the same as not, oops, and one parenthesis less implies false. So at least we know that x, x, a, a, x, c is a function. It's a proof that takes a k and equal to something. Well, yeah, it found a hole here. Um, but then this question, what, what is this k? And we can expand one layer more. So this first argument is actually an or p not p to false. So if we line things up a bit, we see this K is of that type. And then on the right-hand side, we have to provide a proof of falsity. Well, we know that falsity is a little bit difficult to prove, but we've got an assumption here, which is K. So perhaps using that one, we can do it. Because notice that this is a tantalizing opportunity. If we can apply K to something, then we can get it to prove false for us. So we can apply, the only hope to get false here, I would say, is K applied to something. Well, underscore. <laughs> so what, what could this uh, underscore be? Well, if we look at the type here, at least we know it's a function. So K is a higher order function because it's applied to some other function. So um, X arrow, something. And now it's three o'clock, so we don't have time to finish this one here. Uh, it is finished in the book, and I do encourage you to read that chapter, and I will fill it in and upload it, so we got it here as well. But notice what I'm doing here is basically trying to proceed without much or any choice. So, so far, I just expanded to types and noted it has an argument. I can only prove false through this function. I have to apply it to something. That thing has to be a function and so on. So uh, the next few steps is useful to also do. There are some more exercises as well. But that will be all for um, this lecture. And I will probably upload an extra lecture with some more um, proof examples um, before the end of the week. Okay. Bye.